So we're pretty worried that participation in democracy in New Zealand is falling away, and, and falling away quite quickly. I mean, it peaked at 90% turnout for the um, 84 elections, down to 70, just 76, I think. But if you look at the old people versus the young people, then the old ones are up over 80, high 80s actually, um, and the young ones are down in the 40s. So there's this massive schism between you know the interest in democracy by older people and by younger people. And it's not just confined to New Zealand, we're seeing it the world over. In fact, the, um, the whole sort of belief in democracy over the last, whatever, 80 years actually has fallen away dramatically in New Zealand's case from um, about 80% down to 30 that think that actually democracy is essential. Now, it's fallen everywhere, but you take a country like Sweden, it's only down to 60. So, you know, in some places it's eroding a, a lot more quickly. So we want to do something about, about this, because if you don't have participation in democracy, well, what the hell are we here, here for? And so the guts of um, what we're proposing, we've sort of got four legs to it, really. Um, by far the biggest is we need a constitution. So we need New Zealanders to know what's our value set, what do we stand for, what do we take pride in, and what will we not allow anybody to erode. That's what a constitution is. And New Zealand's one of three democracies, just three in the world, that don't have a um, constitution. So for us, that's a massive hole. Now, you know, the guts of a constitution is basically the Bill of Rights or the Human, Act, uh, Human Rights Act. So it's not that difficult. You know, it's personal freedom, political freedom, um, freedom to associate, that sort of thing. Um, rights, you know, rights of the child, well, let's just take that one, rights of the child. I think in um, Brazil, for example, they've just brought into their constitution that any advertising to children is child abuse. So, you know, there's plenty of room here to, I think, beef this up. Religious rights is another one. Religious rights are fine, as long as they don't infringe on the rights of the individual. But you, so we need all of that. The public needs to understand this and it needs to staunchly defend this stuff because they're being eroded and that's what's un, underpinning this fall away in support for voting and especially amongst young, young people. But there's sort of three things that are also pretty unique to New Zealand that we can incorporate in that constitution. Obviously the treaty. I'm not going to talk about the treaty today. I've been talking about that for the last week. Um, so, you know, that, that's um, pretty important important, but the rights of nature, ecosystems, Brazil has just put into its constitution that you have to protect the natural ecosystems of the country. What's the second biggest issue in New Zealand? It's about fresh water, which is exactly, um, you know, is exactly that issue. And the last one, which is why we're standing here in front of TVNZ, which I'll get to, is the um, rights of the public service. The rights of the public service to, um, which you and I fund as taxpayer, um, the rights of the public service to provide independent um, advice in the public interest to whoever is the Minister of the Day. And one of the big problems we've seen over recent years is that those um, departments, those public service departments, have become corporate officers of the Minister of the Day, which is not necessarily interest of the interest of the taxpayer. So how we'd sort of get into this? is there's two elements to it, that there's that one, the constitution, and then we have to restore the sovereignty of parliament. Good, can we just turn back? How would selling TVNZ... Well, I'm going to come to TVNZ, okay. so I'm right. going to Sorry. give you yeah. quite a bit of time on TVNZ. Right. Um, so uh, we have to restore the sovereignty of parliament, which apparently is sovereign. Well, it's not sovereign. What's sovereign now is the cabinet. The cabinet makes all the decisions, they run them through, they fast track them, you know, New Zealand's got the lowest quotient of any democracy I've seen of people, um, quorum in terms of people it needs in Parliament to pass legislation. Basically, every MP that's not in the Cabinet is a waste, is a waste of space. There's purely voting fodder. That's not what Parliament's supposed to do. Parliament is supposed to scrutinise legislation, have a debate, and where it necessarily amend it. It's a, a, a necessary amend it. It doesn't do that anymore. So why has Parliament lost its sovereignty? That, that's the big question. Because that's basically pissing people off as well. What's the point now? Um, so the reason for that is we got rid of the check on Parliament's, the defender of Parliament's sovereignty, which is the upper house. 
We got rid of that in 1950, it's not that long ago. And ever since then we've seen a bigger and bigger concentration of power in the hands of Cabinet. And we've seen Ministers of the Day just fast track stuff through that is clearly not in the public interest. You know, it's against sort of what our constitution really sh should comprise of. The, the best example would be Robert Mul so Robert Muldoon with, when he wiped contributory um, superannuation and brought in New Zealand super. Now we're, you know, we're years on from that and we still haven't dealt with it. It's a massive problem and you guys, you know, you're younger than me, you're paying for this monster. And my generation is, you know, enjoying the, thanks very much, enjoying the benefits of it. It's just not right. The intergenerational inequity of that legislation is terrible. That would never have happened with an upper house because the upper house would have said to parliament, hey, you can't do that, that's unconstitutional. That's a transfer between generations, you know, hand up. So the, the, the way that parliament exercises its sovereignty is it has an upper house that is not sovereign. All an upper house can do is tell parliament, please reconsider. And in the UK, for example, it can tell them twice. And then if at the end of the day, parliament says, tough, we're gonna do it. That doesn't matter so, because they are sovereign, but the public knows. So if you've got the two aspects, you know, the public are very conscious of what's in their constitution and what their values are and what they're defending, so they're staunch. And only the public can change the constitution. It's not hard-coded, the public can change, but only the public. Parliamentarians can't change it. So that's one check. And the other check comes from above, which says to, par you know, the upper house says, hey, parliament, you, you can't do that. So it highlights it to you and, you and me, and we go and protest about it. All of that has been wiped in New Zealand. It's a disaster. So that's what that amounts to. Right, last two items then. The public service. The public service is paid by you and me. Its duty is to provide independent advice to the Minister of the Day. It's also got to obviously process the Minister's requests. But what's happened with government departments is that they're processing the Minister's requests and doing bug all else. That's the issue. And you can see it with OIA, you know, with their requests, where they ask, you know, you go and ask your, um, the government, the, the public service, can I see these documents? There's two things that have happened. The delays in producing the documents are inordinate now, longest they've ever been. And when you do get the document, it's redacted, you know, blacked out, um, right through it. And so now we've got, you know, the Ombudsman having to conduct yet another inquiry on OIA, we should be having, we should have a transparent government, it shouldn't be anything like, it's all part of this corporatisation of the public service. Last item. So, so sorry, so how would you fix that then? Well, I mean that's part of the constitution. So that's in the constitution right. and immediately the upper house goes, excuse me, <laughs> yeah. you're not allowed to do that. And you and I know as a public, yeah they're not allowed to do right. that. And so the cabinet says, oh I can't get away with that one, so it goes to the floor and of course Parliament, um, they're very, you know, animated about it. So the last issue is public interest broadcasting, news, that sort of stuff, public information. Now the problem with this, sort this thing here, TVNZ, is that it's owned by me, the taxpayer, but it's basically in a headlong race against corporate media. That's the, that's, it's got to fight them for survival because its business model is revenue-based, you know, advertising-based, whatever. What the hell is the taxpayer doing investing in something like this? What the taxpayer wants is, is quality, unbiased, independent journalism, right? It doesn't care what channel it goes down. It can go through radio, it can go through TV, it can go online stream, I don't care. Now, it's gone are the days where owning the media outlet, t you know, television channel is you know, was, was critical to the government. Well gone are the days. So we need to sell this, get rid of it, and take the money, if there's any in it, land and buildings are worth quite a bit actually, but anyway, take the money and invest that money in content, in public interest broadcasting content each year. And whatever mechanism that goes down, whatever transmission um, channel that goes down is irrelevant. As long as the journalists doing it have their integrity intact and they're actually doing this for reasons of public interest which I thought was like the Hippocratic Oath for doctors. You never violate the public interest. Now look around you in terms of what they've done to this journalist 
um, profession. Are, are you saying that journalists at TVNZ don't have integrity? Not just, t well TVNZ is the only one that's publicly owned. The answer to your question is that's exactly what I'm saying. Because their whole survival, their agenda, depends on meeting the um, corporate model of, of media. And I'll give you a really good example so, of this. So you're saying then that the corporate journalists don't have integrity it's a, either? I'm saying it's a different agenda to public interest broadcasting. It's a hugely different agenda. Let's take some examples, right? Now what they do with newsreaders is they turn them into stars. So they'll do a bloody report on an event or, uh, you know, and then they'll have to, they'll sit there and they'll opine on what they think of that event. I don't give a stuff what they think, Can right? Can you give an example? Oh yeah, well, I can give you heaps of examples. Um, Hosking would be one. Henry would, I mean, tell me one it isn't. Henry would be another, they're all over the place. Now I don't mind those guys in the private sector doing that. Whether they're in Al Jazeera or CNN or, you know, Fox News or TV3 or what? I don't mind that. That's not what I'm talking about. But this is taxpayer funded, this thing, and it should be totally independent. I mean, I even see it creeping into um, Radio New Zealand. Well, you say taxpayer funded, but TVNZ returns a dividend to taxpayer. Yeah, but look at the dividend over the capital invested. It is pathetic. So the test, therefore, is what is the public, what is the public good that this thing is producing? And I would go zero. And that's the criteria why, you know, that we use on all of this. So that's where we are. So to sum this whole thing, democracy's got to be put back on the rails uh, you, or you are going to continue to see younger people especially, and there's more younger people under 50 now than over 50. First election, this is the first election that's happened. Those people are just going to be disenfranchised, disinterested, and the government of the day is simply going to serve the needs of my generation, which you know was born with its head in the trough, still has got its head in the trough, and we've got young people, especially young children, who are going without. It is inexcusable. We need to get democracy back to where it should be. And that's a constitution, an upper house, a public service that actually produces public goods and public broadcasting that does the same. How much would you hope to sell TVNZ for? Oh, I've got no idea. I haven't looked at it. But its dividend, I think, last year was, what, six million? And before that, I think it was spending its dividend on buying its building. You know, it's flash. That is not the point of public broadcasting. And this entity though that you would set up with the funds from the sale, tell us more about that. Well all that would do is employ journalists obviously who haven't lost their integrity and will be so relieved to get it back um, to produce um, product that is in the public interest. And then what channel it goes down, whether it's TV3, TV1, you know, ZB, whoever, doesn't matter, that's a second order issue. How would you distinguish between the journalists that have integrity and the ones who <laughs> I can see self-interest coming in and here. Look, all journalists are taught when they go through journalism school about integrity. I think you're missing my point. I'm not saying they're a, a, a bunch of, or you, a bunch of ratbags. What I'm saying is the pressure on you from the system, the corporatized system, makes you have to serve your masters. You should not be in public interest broadcasting serving your masters, you should be serving me. I used to work at RNZ, now I'm at TVNZ. Okay. Are you saying I lost my integrity moving from one to the next? I'm saying the pressure on TVNZ is inordinate and you have to, you know, if you get high enough here, you have to make yourself into a star because that's the way and, and sit in front of that TV and tell us all your view. I don't give a stuff about your view. I want to know what are the facts here. I'm perfectly capable of digesting them myself. I don't want to know what Paul Henry thinks about an issue. Or Hosking, or any of those clowns. You know, the they belong it, in the though. corporate sector. Blurring the line of it though between hosts who are paid to deliver opinion and reporters who are paid to report on the facts. Because most of us wouldn't compare yeah. ourselves to Hosking or Paul no, Henry. No, okay, well look, that's an interesting discussion. Um, yes, there, there is a difference. But let me talk to you about it in print media, which I can see is where you come from. The number of phone calls I get from guys who have interviewed me on something factual and then they ring and apologise the next day because the sub-editor has changed the headline which was about some issue, you know, the treaty or whatever the hell it is, and he's got to open with cats because he knows that will get the eyeballs when it comes to talking about Gareth Morgan. It's pathetic. Talk about the issue. Especially, and I'm just saying, that's fine in the corporate sector private sector, I have no issue with that, whatever rocks your boat. 
but I certainly have an issue with it with public sector broadcasting. Do you think some of these concerns about TVNZ could be addressed through less drastic measures, like the reintroduction of the Charter? Well, it's sort of, that's what I'm talking about, really. So get rid of all the baubles here and the star power, right, and just give us the information and put it down the same channels, you know, whether it's TVNZ or whether it's TV3, put it out, or online streaming, I don't care. But it's content that matters. Yeah. Or would you consider reducing the imperative or removing the imperative for TVNZ to return a dividend? so that it wasn't profit driven? Yeah, I want, I don't want TVNZ, all right? Just get that out of your head. Because there's TV channels everywhere. That is not an issue. And we're all watch, watching TV online now anyway. Who the hell watches free, free to air, you know? Some people do, I realize that. But there's a lot of choices. What I'm concerned about is the quality of the content of, of the public sector dollar, right? I don't care what the commercial guys do and they, they will go to where the ratings are the highest and that's fine, that's a commercial model I just want the truth back, thanks I'm good can I just get a shot of you guys here and um, one question doesn't New Zealand on Air do perform part yeah. of that mechanism? yeah it does, about? so it's the funder right, that will pick those sort of things but New Zealand on Air does tend to do what would you call it, magazine type stuff. I mean, it obviously does drama as well, so it's got a far wider brief to make sure New Zealand acting and all that is on TV and, and uh, is on media, and that's fine. And in film, that's fine. I'm actually talking about the news and current events. That's what I'm talking about. I'm really worried that we're getting jaundiced views driven by corporate masters, and would, I don't like it. It's propaganda. You, it's nothing but propaganda. Would you consider stepping into the breach yourself? If you're a few media companies up for sale, would you consider buying MediaWorks or something like that to restore the balance yourself? No. <laughs> no thanks. But I can think of easy ways to make money. <laughs> are, are you saying that some sort of corporate interest, a company or what have you, has a daily say in the news agenda and the way that news Oh, totally what the way it's packaged and presented. I mean, look at this whole star thing, you know, where you have a journalist um, basically giving their opinion on the news. I mean, you must think this guy's watching television or something is sick, you know, it's just pollution. It's propaganda, I don't want to know. If you don't care particularly about which channel it goes down, would you consider selling RNZ and putting that into the different Totally. Well? In principle, same thing. It's content that matters, I agree. What do you you think can't have one rule so, for so, one so, and one for the other. Just totally. on that note, so yeah. as part of this policy, RNZ would also be up for sale? Well, it's, that's a consistent line. What's, what you're selling, what the public wants is, is um, public's, public good content. Yeah. What, what, whoever says, well, can you send this bit down my channels because I, I've got higher ratings than that. So there's yeah. still competition in the private sector. That's fine. That's just open by tender, you know. So. I'm trying to separate the content from the um, infrastructure. What do you think of Labor's policy to establish a TV wing of RNZ to bring back public broadcasting to television? Big bucks! So, first question is, oh yeah, so just tell me where the money's coming from. Which From tax selling TVNZ? Pro oh, the same! <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I've helped them there. Yeah, that's how they could do it. But no, I, d I just don't think it's clever for the taxpayer to be, inv to be invested in any one type of medium ch uh, media channel because they're chopping and changing so fast. I mean, you're getting more and more of it just on your phone, online. So it's all going online, you know, the barriers to entry are nothing. So let's put the money into content and independent content where the journalists all have their integrity very precious to their hearts. Thanks, guys. All right. Okay.